Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this bright blue fringe event on delivering net zero, building Britain's resilient recovery, um, which we are doing in partnership with WSP. Uh, and just to say that uh, it's a continuing partnership because we did produce an essay collection earlier this year called Delivering Net Zero, which uh, had a lot of contributions from different senior politicians, CEOs, academics on um, the paths, uh, sorry, on the policies that we need to take to uh, achieve that new net zero goal. Um, you know, the easy step was legislating for net zero, actually delivering it and getting that deep decarbonisation across different sectors um, is going to be the real challenge. Uh, and today's debate includes uh, speakers who contributed, uh, or writers who contributed to uh, that essay collection. Uh, so it's great to, ha to have them here. For those of you who don't know Bright Blue, uh, we are an independent think tank for liberal conservatism. We are doing a major relaunch uh, this autumn, so please watch out for that. But broadly, our focus is on domestic uh, educational, economic, social, and most crucially, environmental policy, where we've had a lot of success on government policy and public discourse. Not least, um, we uh, strongly advocated for the adoption of the net zero target uh, a few years ago, suggesting that there was a sound legal, political, technological, and evidential basis for adopting uh, that net zero target. Um, if you're tweeting, please use uh, the hashtag brightblue and hashtag CPC20. Uh, and our Twitter handles are at, at wearebrightblue and at WSP underscore UK. Um, the Q&A box, which is normally on the right hand side of your screens where you can ask questions to the panelists, uh, is currently um, uh, out of use. Um, there's a te technical problem which we're trying to resolve. So if you do have a question, please use Twitter and just uh, ask the question uh, using the Twitter handle hashtag bright blue. Uh, but hopefully that Q&A box uh, will be back soon. But in the meantime, ask questions through that. And I will then ask uh, the questions on your behalf to the panellists. Um, another thing to say about Bright Blue is we've just released a magazine looking at the impact of COVID on our lives and on society. And you can download that uh, from our website um, and includes a tr uh, an interview with the Treasury Minister, Jesse Norman. So today's session, uh, as I say, is looking at how we deliver that net zero uh, target, what sort of policies are needed and what sort of technologies are needed across the different economic sectors to really drive uh, deep decarbonisation. And what are the role for different actors? So not just uh, national government, but local government, uh, the private sector, and we as individuals, the changes that we might be uh, expected to make as well. So we've got a great panel. We have Nadeem Sahawi MP, who's the Minister for Business and Industry, um, and also the Member of Parliament for Stratford-upon-Avon. Mayor Ben Houghton, who is the current Tees Valley Mayor, uh, which is uh, a position he's held since 2017. Laura Sands, um, who is a former Conservative MP, um, and also was the chair of the government's energy uh, data task force. Professor Michael Grubb, uh, who is the professor of energy and climate change at University College London. Rachel Skinner, uh, who is the current ICE vice president and executive director and head of transport for WSP's UK planning and advisory business. Um, and I always forget to introduce myself, but the caption has kindly come up, but I'm Ryan Shorthouse, I'm the director of Bright Blue. So I'm gonna ask speakers to speak for five minutes each, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions. So Nadim, perhaps um, if you could go first, although I can just see that Nadim may have uh, dropped out for technical issues uh, temporarily. So we'll just go instead to Ben first, and then we'll come to, uh, to Nadim after that, so Ben. Well, thank you, Ryan, and thank you to Bright Blue for inviting me onto the uh, onto the panel to talk about net zero. It's one of my uh, certainly one of my pet projects, and something that is extremely close to the people of the Tees Valley's hearts. Knowing that we're going to be one of the regions to be able to drive this 
forward because I think your opening remarks were perfect, Ryan, in that the easy bit was signing up to a net zero target by 2050. The much more complicated answer is how you actually deliver it in a sensible fashion, one that meets that climate change and uh, decarbonisation target in 2050, but to do it in a very sensible, managed way that doesn't cost jobs, doesn't make uh, things like utilities and energy costs more expensive, and that's a much more nuanced answer. And I think places like Teesside, places like uh, Cheshire, places like Grangemouth and the Humber, for me, are going to be the real driving forces around the production end of clean green technologies, whether that's carbon capture and storage, whether that's hydrogen, whether that's offshore wind, um, all playing a, a significant mix to be able to reach that net zero target. And one of the other reasons I'm on this call is that only last week the government announced that Teesside would be the first national hydrogen transport centre um, as a result of all of the work that we're doing is specifically around hydrogen. And I think for my start of a turn, I think what we need to see is uh, much more commitment from government around some specific types of technology that I think industry would tell you are ready if government is ready to embrace it. So things like carbon capture, utilisation and storage, I think is widely um, accepted as being certainly a transitional technology to net zero, if not an important mix in reaching that target. And then going further than we did uh, before Theresa May as Prime Minister signed us up to net zero 2050, to get to that 100% decarbonisation, I do think hydrogen is going to play a key role in that. Now, to do that, I think we need government to commit to a funding model for carbon capture and storage. I think government need to put front and centre um, the hydrogen strategy that has been long talked about. And I think we need to have parity of esteem between hydrogen and things like battery technology and electric technology and things like transport, as well as at the production end as well. So I think it's a very complicated picture. I think we've got to marry the production end with the supply chain, hydrogen with CCUS, with things like offshore wind, with things like steam methane reformers. And then we've got to start to educate, I think, especially around things like hydrogen technology, I think we've got to start to educate the public uh, because even just on the fantastic announcement we had last week from DFT, the only critical response we got, um, as well as all the positive messages of support, was one about the Hindenburg disaster and whether the hydrogen is a, is a safe is a safe fuel. And I think there are a lot of myths and outdated views on things like hydrogen, that if it had parity of esteem with other forms of renewables and, and had parity of esteem within the government sphere of something that we were going to move forward with, then that communication and education to the public for mass take up of things like hydrogen, I think would play a key role as well. And then the very final thing is, actually, as part of the government's levelling up agenda, I do think net zero, by definition of where the types of skills bases are, where the industry currently lies, this is a fantastic example, not of just the government being a world leader on a world stage of net zero, but actually a clear demonstration for levelling up that the, uh, the in phase one, whether it's hydrogen, CCS, uh, whether it's offshore wind, as well as other technologies, a lot of that is driven in the north. A lot of that is driven in post-industrial heartlands like Teesside, like parts of the northwest, like parts of Scotland. And so I think it ticks all of the boxes that this government is trying to deliver. And I think the regions, to some extent, have the answers for government. And we want the government to get behind that, which with a team like Nadim and, and Alok at the helm, I think um, I think we've got the right people in place to deliver it. Great. Thank you very much, Ben. Just to say that the technical problems with the Q&A box have now been resolved. So um, if you do want to ask questions via the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen, then um, you can do that. Um, right. So the return of the minister. So Nadim is back uh, and hopefully we won't be relying on your Internet technology as a, um, as a way to get as to net zero. Hopefully the technologies will be more robust than that. <laughs> Nadim. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, can everyone hear me? Um, uh, we can. Apologise uh, for the technical glitch, um, uh, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm very grateful to be here. I want to share with you, obviously, some of our thinking, uh, our work that we've done, um, uh, and then I hope uh, we'll have enough time for uh, Q and A, obviously, and also to hear from other uh, panelists. Ben Houchen is, is you know, uh, very practically uh, outlined some of the challenges, but also some of the opportunities as well. Uh, clearly, since March, the dominant driver uh, of uh, the economy uh, has been through the sort of the coronavirus pandemic uh, lens. Uh, we wrapped our ar arms around jobs in the sort of first chapter, second chapter, sort of reopening the economy, 
And the third is how do you get a resilient recovery? Uh, and you heard more from the Chancellor today about helping those that uh, will be affected um, by the virus in terms of uh, 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 sort of, you know, the ability to give them a, a hand up to get the, the jobs that, that uh, will come forward, which is actually very much related to what we're talking about here today uh, in many ways. And I hope we can explore it more in more detail in the Q&A. Um, but realistically, obviously, given uh, this backdrop, you know, the, 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 the question from everyone here is, you know, what have we been doing in terms of uh, the strategy around um, uh, energy? Um, so whilst we've been dealing with COVID with you know, operationalizing everything that the Chancellor has um, uh, um, announced, whether it's the bounce back loans or the furlough scheme or C bills, CL bills, the future fund and so on. We've also been thinking and working on the energy white paper, uh, which uh, was due to be launched in at the end of March, obviously delayed now uh, till this autumn. But now uh, we are almost there. I, I can certainly say to to you, we will absolutely publish it. It will be the roadmap to to net zero. Uh, my very strong um, advice to my officials has been around, you know, how do you legislate for something that's thirty years away where you can't? You've got to take it in, in chunks of, of decades. So we, we've got to look at this next ten years. What do we need to do in terms of uh, our portfolio mix of energy generation, whether it be nuclear, offshore wind, which has been a remarkable success. Um, Thirty-six percent of the whole of this Earth's uh, uh, energy offshore energy production is now delivered by the United Kingdom. We want to go even further, but also learn the lessons as to how to make sure that the supply chain and the jobs come to the United Kingdom. And then, of course, nuclear, large nuclear, SMRs and AMRs as well, and other renewables. I think we've had a tremendous success, but I do think we need to uh, share with industry uh, that very clear strategy so that they can begin. Uh, to think about the investments they need to make. And of course, followed by the Energy White Paper uh, will be a hydrogen strategy, a really ambitious hydrogen strategy uh, uh, that you will see, which will uh, you know, basically, uh, I think, in many ways, answer the questions around uh, the investment and how seriously we're taking both um, uh, uh, blue hydrogen, uh, so uh, the CCUS issue, but also green hydrogen which is very much linked to nuclear and of course to offshore uh, wind big big ambitions uh, from this government um i guess uh, there are sort of three things we need to do to be able to deliver on that one is that sort of clarity and strategic direction uh, from government uh, the second is really sort of the financial framework uh, uh, that will allow the private sector to come in and invest and then, you know, clear and honest um, uh, and transparent uh, 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 articulation of how we're going to pay for all this. Um, you know, carbon pricing is going to be critical uh, to this. I think if we can deliver those three things, uh, we begin to deliver, I think, uh, a strategy that is, you know, one, credible, but also deliverable um, uh, over the next decade. And then when you get closer to the, 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 the sort of the 2030s, you can begin to flex that strategy for the 2030s and obviously then the 2040s and uh, uh, meeting that net zero target by 2050. It's a big ambitious strategy. If you look at what we need in terms of, if I take say nuclear, uh, we probably need about 30 um, uh, uh, megawatts of nuclear, 30 gigawatts of nuclear, my apologies, uh, with Hinkley, and if we do one more large nuclear, we're only talking about 3.2, 3.3 .3, uh, 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 gigawatts of, of, of nuclear. Um, so big, big ambitions uh, to come from this government. What I'd like to do, obviously, today is really sort of uh, from uh, uh, this um, fantastic think tank, but also from the panelists here, is really understand a bit more uh, about um, you know how you think we should be working in uh, Bayes. Uh, we've also got the sort of short term uh, investment. So if you look at, say, the Green Homes Grant uh, that the Chancellor announced, two billion pounds for uh, uh, providing homeowners you know, a, 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 the ability to make their homes energy efficient, but also providing jobs to builders, glaziers, roofers, electricians who have all been hit hard by uh, the coronavirus. Uh, and of course, um, local government's got a big role to play 
in this as well, uh, in the sense that um, uh, if you look at you know EV charging points across the country, uh, we've got to make sure we deliver uh, that you know twenty four thousand public charging points that make uh, the UK the largest in Europe. But we've got to go even further um, uh, and and make sure uh, we we make that investment, the half a billion that was announced earlier in the budget, so that we install a further six thousand uh, high power charge points uh, across our motorways. And a roads uh, by uh, 2035. Because if we're asking people to make that transition, I'll, I'll and I'll leave you with that just final thought, which is about you know how do we incentivize the personal, if I can call it that, so that actually uh, uh, people can begin to personally think about how they decarbonize uh, uh, their lifestyle. Uh, then I think we need to think about both incentives and obviously uh, the uh, ability to make it as as easy as possible, as painless as possible for them. Uh, to do uh, some of this stuff. Um, I think I'll stop there, Ryan, but thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, delighted to be here and really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Nadim. Um, one question I did want you to answer very quickly was, we brought out a report, Bright Blue, um, last week, just looking at public attitudes to um, the kind of credibility of net zero and who's responsible for it and the policies that are needed. It was quite a comprehensive report. But one thing we did find was there was a lot of uh, recognition of the changes that individuals needed to make. For example, the way they heated their homes, the way they traveled about. But once you ask them, well, are you, gonna, are you willing to pay more for this? Uh, there was a lot of skepticism about that. So uh, is this road to decarbonization going to be very costly to consumers? Is it going to be somewhat costly to consumers? Do we have to be honest about that? Um, or, you know, can it be cost free? Well, I hope you uh, heard me uh, say that we have to be honest about how we pay for this, which was one of my, my sort of the, the three things that we need to make sure uh, happen. Um, uh, and I think we can do that in a in, in number of ways. So if you look at Hinkley Point, um, uh, the um, cost of that uh, 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 you know, energy, 70% of it is actually the cost of finance. And so if we're smarter at how we do uh, uh, finance around energy generation, and we're getting better at it. You know, whether we, you, you see the, the, you know, 15 years ago, if I told you that the United Kingdom would be 36% of the whole of the Earth's energy, offshore energy generation, you'd have laughed me out of you know, this, this, uh, this round table um, or laughed me out of court. Um, we, we, we are that today, but we've got to learn the lessons, i.e., you know, we've created a 46 billion pound business in Northern Europe. Um, how do we create you know, those sort of um, incentives and the environment for people to come and invest here, both in the supply chain, but also in some of the new technologies, whether it's SMRs or AMRs on nuclear or other renewable technologies. So I think you can create a, a, an environment where you attract investment, which begins to pay for some of this stuff. But also you have to be honest with people as to how and what you expect their behavior to be. Uh, but we're looking at everything. So we've got the Jet the 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 uh, Jet Zero Council looking at aviation, looking at synthetic fuels, biofuels. Because you know you're not going to be able to fly uh, long haul without looking at, at, at fuels as well as some of the new technologies around um, uh, uh, aircraft design, whether uh, you know hydrogen or uh, electric. So big questions. But you're right to, to highlight that we have to be, uh, uh, which is why I called it sort of the personal. Um, uh, uh, part of this strategy, which is, you know, how do I personally decarbonize and make it as easy for people to do as possible? Well, part of it is charging anxiety. We know that, which is why we're investing so much in, in, in uh, charge points and, of course, in, in, in that um, ability to charge much faster than what, what you car currently can do. Um, you know, I was a convert to Tesla uh, immediately, but it's difficult um, uh, when you're having to travel from London to Stratford and Avon um on, on a friday and then have to do a whole constituency day uh, you have to really plan your day i want to be second nature where people can actually then you know, not think about it in the way they do currently with hydrocarbons great thank you minister rachel thank you brian thanks hopefully you can hear me okay 
Okay. Um, right. So, um, in terms of my role on this panel today, I'm, I'm here representing, I, I guess, more of a private sector business angle in a, in a general sense around net zero carbon and its role in terms of a resilient recovery. But more specifically, um, I'm an executive director with WSP, where um, I've headed up our uh, 600 strong transport team, largest of its kind in the UK, actually, which is fantastic. Um, beyond that, uh, WSP, for those who don't know it, is a near 50,000 person professional services uh, business spanning spanning the world, expertise across engineering and planning, so energy, transport, buildings, water, digital, environmental services, all the kinds of things we're talking about in, in this group today. Um, now, coming straight to my point of view, I guess, um, I think from a business perspective, what's really interesting here is that when we're thinking about the more forward thinking businesses out there, we are already seeing net zero carbon as a genuine opportunity to grow, not just out of COVID, but also for the longer run, rather than as a burden. Um, I think the urgency to act is absolutely clear and established. And, and for some time, actually, um, we and others like us have been keen to support and endorse the political commitments that will actually bring this to life in practice. And, and as we've been hearing, we've got many government departments, many local authorities and so on, already acting in this space in terms of policy making. But we need to turn those policies and commitments into actual, real, sustained action. And I think when you come to the private sector side of things, this is very much a two way street. And we can all see there will be trade offs to be made. But there are definitely all sorts of things we can be doing to create some serious and rapid change in this space. Um, so I guess the other side of it, really, and to be perfectly honest, is that from a from a private sector and a business perspective in the infrastructure space, we can all see that the net zero carbon agenda is the thing that will actually put our collective profession more widely, so both public and private sector, on the map and keep it on the map for the next century and more. Uh, and we all know that since the Industrial Revolution, infrastructure is the thing that has unpinned, under, underpinned and unlocked economic growth and mobility, connectivity, clean water, et cetera, et cetera, for billions of people all over the world, not just in the UK. And so obviously we want to hold on to those things in a post-COVID world, but we now need to, I think, to use the COVID recovery period as a chance to shift tracks and make sure that we stay relevant and, and we, I guess, shift our game a bit in terms of where we want to focus and why. So to me, one of the things that we really need to concentrate on and get much more right in terms of our recovery plans for the UK is that instead of, as I say, talking about sustainability and talking about the carbon piece of all of that, we now need to really mean it. And it needs to be completely central in terms of the direct impact that that then, that then brings through and the benefits in terms of climate change. So infrastructure across all sectors, and it's difficult to get it exact figures on this because it depends on where you look for the different sources of data, but there is a massive role to play here. Roughly 70 odd percent of carbon emissions globally, all you know, every sector all over the world have a direct and clear line straight back to infrastructure. So there really isn't an infrastructure asset out there that we as an industry haven't kind of had our hands on in terms of uh, creating the systems that we rely on every day. So transport, whether it's road or rail or active travel, tools, short buildings, clean water, reliable energy, all of those different things. So all of us as, as an industry facing you know, the, the delivery side of this, whether we're clients or consultants, contractors and so on, we now very often own and operate those assets every day or support their, uh, their operation. Um, so really, I can see that our role in terms of going through the COVID period and beyond, we need to shift the way that we think about those different systems and we need to change and decarbonise them incredibly fast because clearly that 70% is unacceptable and, and needs to come down as fast as possible. The, the great thing is, of course, that we have the potential to do that because we understand how those things go together. Um, one point I just wanted to clarify, just having heard the previous couple of speakers, is that yes, this is about energy. But it's also about all the other infrastructure sectors as well, because they all fit together. And, and while energy has a key part to play, and obviously we're further perhaps along the road towards decarbonisation in that space, there is a huge amount of work to do in the, in the transport and building space in particular, but also all other infrastructure sectors as well in terms of generating that true circular economy that then has spin-off benefits all the way through. So we're really keen and we're sort of standing ready, I suppose, to, to support this transition for, for all the right reasons. And mainly because we know, as I'm sure everybody else does, and we appreciate that there are three legs on this sustainability stool. And one of them is economic in terms of generating economic growth in a purely sustainable sense. But the other two are environmental and social. So in order to actually drive through 
the, the, the COVID crisis of the moment and the climate crisis more generally, we really need to make sure that we're thinking about how those three work together. And I think primary amongst the, the environmental side of things right now, although there are other things, of course, out there as well, that the carbon element of it is absolutely the number one on the list. And we need to make sure that in terms of that recovery, we're taking communities with us of all types. It's very tempting, isn't it, to think of infrastructure just as a, a series of really large, discrete projects when actually we need to be thinking about the social impacts across all types of communities in all sorts of places, not just as north, south or urban, rural, but also in terms of neighbouring streets and specifics of very, very local communities. Because these, these different things that we choose to invest in or not invest in have a hugely personal and very specific impact. So if we get the transition to net zero carbon wrong, we actually risk widening the economic and social divides even further than we already have in this country. And that, of course, in itself brings extra cost. If we get it right and we really think through how we invest, where we invest and what we change, you can actually see a way to get benefits across all three of those different aspects of so the economic, the environmental and the social. So the, the, the good news from a business perspective is that we can see time and again that there really is a growing business case to support this effort towards decarbonisation across the infrastructure and the engineering space and it's absolutely possible with the right political backing to make sure that we are building and delivering the right sort of growth to get those balanced outcomes. Um, specific areas I guess just very briefly to finish where the private sector and specifically engineers and planners can best contribute is to mention things like the fact that cities and the public sector simply can't act alone. But as a wider industry, we are ready, we're keen to support and we want to help to define and deliver the best planning for the right infrastructure in the right places and bring that best practice across as fast as possible, not just in the UK, but also bringing across international best practice where we can to make sure that we're catering not just for the needs of 2020 and post-COVID immediately, but also the next generation. Because, of course, the things that we do will still be there in 2050 and well beyond. So hopefully well beyond that net zero carbon, that point where we might actually achieve the net zero um, outcome. At the same time, beyond that, we can obviously drive and support the skills agenda. We can make sure we're attracting the right sort of people, the right diverse mix of people into our industries, train them with the right skills to make sure they can deliver what's actually needed for net zero carbon. Um, I think that applies just as much now, by the way, during these difficult pandemic times as it would do in more buoyant times. And I think we can really help to make policy more real for people out there as well. It, it's commonplace, actually. It's, it's funny because infrastructure gets taken for granted all the time when everything's working fine. Nobody notices it. It's all, it's all absolutely you know, invisible, essentially. And of course, we do notice it when things go wrong, particularly around transport and energy and so on. But I think what's clear if we look at it in the slightly longer range perspective is that actually as we go on, if we can show the public more generally that as we decarbonise, actually life potentially gets better in terms of a quality of life side of things, that social side of things and so on, the connectivity and so on. It actually becomes a much easier sell to the public as we build things into that mix. And I think it's interesting just listening to, to that last response that actually, while we will need to ask for some changes in behaviours, at the moment, perhaps, it's not quite necessary yet to be asking for really drastic or massively costly shifts um, and certainly the overall cost of any action from a public point of view and an individual point of view will be an awful lot less if we get on and generate that behaviour change sooner. Uh, obviously, as time goes on, as things become much more serious and urgent to do with climate change, um, then the impacts will become ever more real. And as we go on, certainly through the next years and decades, I, I guess it's fairly self-evident that the opportunities to ask nicely might become far fewer and, and further between. So I'll, I'll stop there for now, but very much look forward to the discussion in just a few minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, very good to have that positive private sector voice on uh, the net zero transition. Laura, over to you. Thank you very much. And um, very, very good to be on this, uh, this panel. And thanks to, to Bright Blue. Um, also, just wanted to sort of commend the the government for both its ambition on 2050, but also um, a lot of the policies that are coming through at the moment and looking forward to that white paper, Nadine. Um, I feel very strongly that, that net zero is quite a different concept to a consumption concept. It's actually a productivity concept. It's sort of doing more with less. And so tuning into what Rachel was saying, about um, what the benefits are. I actually think that, that we should be pretty ambitious about what I would call the decarbonisation dividend. Um, for the sector itself and the infrastructure sector in its widest thing, 
this is a real call up to modernize because actually both construction, transport that I know Nadine knows well, um, energy are very, very f far behind the curve when you look at them in comparison to others. So it's a modernization agenda. Um, it's also a massive productivity driver because getting more from less isn't the productivity that we're used to, which is about labor productivity. It's actually about resource productivity. And we should be absolutely sweating um, our resources, but also, as Nadine says, our capital. And that capital needs to be extended. And in some ways, we're still shaping our energy system as if it was a fossil fuel ramp it up Johnny type system and not understanding that actually it's the capital, not the commodity that has value. And also from, from consumer point of view, um, we should be enabling them to access much lower prices of that commodity, not necessarily the capital, but actually we are talking about, in some instances, close to zero marginal cost. Um, and there are ways of, of making sure that that happens. Um, consumers However, as we've all commented, do have a veto on net zero. So particularly in areas like Ben represents, um, it's absolutely crucial that no one is left behind. And through a project I, I'm doing with um, some, 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 a group, we're actually looking particularly at the oil and gas sector and how we need to make sure that that migrates. But talking about the 2050 target, I was so pleased that Nadine was saying that um, we need stepping, we need sort of, milestones between that. And um, I, I'm calling at this moment through, through some reports um, that we end up with a 80% decarbonized electricity system by 2030 and decarbonized heat by 2035. This is 80% because we all know that the 20%, the last 20% is very, very heavy lifting. Um, but that sort of target will actually drive investment and we'll, we'll get an accelerated move towards it. Um, but it does mean also that um, the government and the sector itself have to do the heavy lifting. I'm very against, and I absolutely reiterate what Rachel was saying, as I'm very against this issue about us talking about behaviour change today. Um, we have got to make the green option the really easy option and make the brown option the really difficult. The dirty option must be complicated. And at the moment, we've got it the other way around. Um, there's also a very important point which really comes from both Ben and Rachel, and that is location, location, location. Um, we're very used to a lovely centralized energy system that um, tells you from the center exactly what color socks you're going to wear on Thursday. Um, actually, what we need is we need lo location centric solutions and they will be different. And I think that that actually will create lots of diversity and lots of small businesses. But my one plea to you, Nadim, is that when we look at the money, the capital that's going to be invested, we will need to invest a lot in some of this big stuff, right? No question. But could we also spread the joy? And spreading the joy means that the capacity market, which spends a lot of money, should be absolutely equally looking at energy efficiency, which is a capacity mechanism. That contracts for difference should be delivered and on offer to people who want to de-risk their, um, their solar panels or their EV cars, because these are all parts of the energy system, and they all require that same level of capital de-risking. So if I'm going to buy myself some PV on my house, that is as big an ask of me as it is of Orsted to do an offshore wind farm. And I think we need to democratize some of these funding mechanisms, offer them much more broadly, and actually therefore build supply chains and small businesses that can actually service this. Um, I think it's a massive opportunity. I think it absolutely brings the public into the, into the journey and delivers personal benefits to them. Uh, my very last point is, did you know that we have carbon plated a lot of our standards right across the economy? That we have gas that's higher calorific value than any other country in the world? That um, our steel and concrete could be less materialized? and that 
if government asks British Standards Institute to actually do an audit and decarbonize a lot of our standards, we could look at eight to 10% um, of carbon being taken out of the economy without anybody noticing at all. So let's do the heavy lifting and let's spread the joy to consumers. Laura, thank you. Typically very thoughtful. Uh, let's move now on to Michael. You hear me okay? We can. Um, great. So thanks for the opportunity. Obviously, um, this is a huge area to cover. And uh, I thought I'd just focus on a couple, couple of dimensions. Um, first is pretty familiar to many in terms of renewable energy. And the UK really has made a tremendous success story. Uh, the, I'll also touch briefly on the coming challenge of, of industrial manufacturing. Um, but on renewables, first, a quick re recap. Um, we have just hit 24 gigawatts uh, of uh, offshore wind, I believe. Um, that is a stunning transformation, and the, the collapse in the costs has been, of course, a major part of that. So it's, you know, it's worth reflecting on how many people thought and why they thought this was impossible and how it was actually delivered, which was a real combination of a clear direction of travel um, mapped out, in fact, between successive governments, strong industrial collaboration and a market structure which gave confidence to invest, uh, particularly uh, through the contracts for differences. Um, but it, I'd also stress the degree of industrial collaboration right through the supply chain uh, and the role of, of the Carbon Trust in helping to bring some of the different companies together. Uh, it was really quite an impressive story, which, which certainly has been noted internationally as well. Um, obviously aiming to double up to 40 gigawatts or potentially even more beyond 2030, uh, if we're going to move to net zero, of course we'd need to make the best use of our biggest zero carbon resource. Um, but quite a few things do change or need to be developed uh, as we become more ambitious on that scale. Uh, one of which is the traditional electricity market really is not fit for purpose in such a high renewables world. Um, it's modified hybrid form at the moment is, is doing okay. I don't think it needs radical change immediately, but clearly we need the routes, as Laura said, to get consumers more engaged and more flexible in response to some of the needs. We also will need to build further on the, the interconnection so that power can flow smoothly, uh, including with, with, our continent, with the continent uh, after Brexit. So I think the area uh, potentially a little thorny about close alignment to allow intraday trading as the winds flow across the North Sea uh, and so forth. That's going to be uh, an important part of the story uh, going forward. Uh, and obviously, in terms of its dependence of trade on physical interconnections makes it a somewhat uh, unusual sector, uh, partly in the context of Brexit. But that obviously is part of our current negotiations. So I hope that will all land well and will well facilitate our move to 40 gigawatts uh, and beyond. Um, the other area to, to flag um, beyond still steaming ahead with some of the renewables, but attending to the electricity supporting system at all scales, I should stress, including the small and decentralized. The other issue to touch on briefly is industrial manufacturing. Uh, Andy Street already touched on the Teesside role, the hydrogen announcement. That really seems to be where things are going. One thing that really strikes me in my, my work is I actually see industry champing at the bit more dare I say it, than some of the academics, at the, the speed with which things could be done, given the right framework. But clearly, it's a decade or more behind where we are on, on the wind story, because there's still a lot more options on the table, a lot more R&D investment, a lot more industry confidence building required. And I think one of the big lessons from what we achieved on wind energy was the combination of supply support, including R&D related and, and some of the rollout and demonstrator programs, the underlying infrastructure development, but also credible demand. The big question that I hear from industry is if we've invest seriously in low carbon industrial structures, manufacturing, etc., where is going to be the demand for low carbon materials, low carbon steel, etc.? 
We know there are possibilities, and I think the answers are partly a mix of public procurement of, for example, low carbon materials from cities, government, estate, or so forth, but also economic incentives, uh, carbon pricing has to be part of that mix. And ironically, as Laura said, it's actually a both carrot and stick. It is deter the brown, encourage the, the green, uh, and definitely some of the discussions around the use of revenues from carbon pricing, rechanneled back to support some of the scale of industrial investment we'll need, is central. I guess my final remark is also, of course, in some of these uh, internationally traded sectors, it's not trivial. The UK is going to have to look, as the policy exchange said in their report a couple of weeks ago, at some form of border adjustment mechanism. Probably, again, that is going to be most practical if we can align it with the, the uh, EU discussions in that area. Uh, and that's, that's not going to be easy, but I think to transform industrial manufacturing, to accelerate the hydrogen economy, uh, the government has to pay attention to how do we deliver effective carbon pricing in these sectors. And I'm sure we'll want to move on from that. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Michael. Very rich uh, um, stuff there. So I'm going to go straight to questions uh, and I'm going to take a round of questions um, because we are, uh, we've only got about 15 minutes left. So um, to begin with, um, I have a question from Aline Nassif. Uh, directed to Ben. In fact, you've got a fan, Ben, because she says, uh, thank you for your excellent introduction. The question, does nuclear feature in your vision of post-industrial net zero powerhouse um, in the Northwest? Uh, kind of related question. I, I think I'm going to take, because this is obviously a deliberately cross-sectoral um, discussion. So I'm going to focus on the supply and demand of energy here. So that's the first question on nuclear. Second uh, is from Michael Leonard, who asks, the future home standard proposes that all new homes from 2025 will not be attached to the gas grid. Is this wise if hydrogen may be a long-term solution? Uh, and then the third is from James North, who asks, Dear Minister, surely the retrofit of our existing housing stock must be prioritised in order to decrease emissions, providing jobs whilst doing so. So questions there on energy, supply of energy and demand for energy. So Ben, perhaps um, you can uh, talk to your fan first. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, nuclear absolutely does play a role. We've got the, the nuclear power plant in Hartlepool that's being... Uh, it's got another few years left in it. It's actually got space for another uh, nuclear power station right next door, and we're encouraging government to, to consider that as an option uh, for SMR technology potentially, or even another full-scale plant, which um, absolutely could play a role. And I think actually on Friday, I was on a different fringe talking about hydrogen. I think Laura actually made the point when we were on there as well that the nuclear can play an interesting role post life cycle stability, being able to go into the grid or being able to the energy that, for example, could, choose, uh, could produce really cheap uh, hydrogen um, on a sustainable basis post kind of energy uh, baseline as well. Um, so, yeah, I think nuclear can play an interesting role, not just on a baseline perspective from a decarbonisation perspective, but in other technologies like hydrogen. Um, and obviously we can do that here in Teesside. As I always say, we can do everything in Teesside. Um, on the other two points, I think... I, I, I'm still a believer because the gas grid as it stands can take hydrogen in it, and especially with the rollout of the replacement of the gas grid, the infrastructure is existing. If we can look at a regulatory framework, how we produce the volumes of hydrogen, then it seems like a really obvious thing to decarbonize our gas network by, by introducing up to 100% hydrogen within the grid. That then leads on to the final question, because all of these things are interlinked, is how do you have a vast rollout of um fuel pumps or you know fitting boilers with that are hydrogen ready i mean we do need to get on with that which is where i started my, my remarks at the beginning is industry needs confidence that government government is going to regulate in a way and back these industries so that they can invest in it we know that bosch are producing hydrogen ready boilers but actually from today you need to replace two boilers a minute every minute every hour every day of the year every year up until 2050 that's a million boilers a year um, if you want it to be ready. So there's a huge rollout of work that when you scale it back to day one, it's where do you get the production of the hydrogen from? Because the infrastructure is there. The technology is there from a boiler perspective or even from a transport perspective. I mean, there are hydrogen cars, there are hydrogen buses, there are hydrogen trains. 
But that regulatory framework and giving confidence to the industry to do it is really important. And just that fact, just a very, very, very quick final point. It feels very um, similar to the conversation that's going on with carbon capture as well. And, and the industry is looking for confidence from government to plow the money into it. And there's still a conversation going on with the big players now that they remember that um, the White Rose project was cancelled. And so is government for or against this? And if we put money into it, is government going to change direction? You know, hydrogen, nuclear, our whole energy uh, strategy, never mind the consumer end, is looking for the confidence from government so the money can come in behind it. Because there's plenty of money ready to go if the government can give it confidence. Great. Thank you, Ben. Uh, and just to plug some bright blue work, um, which I'm always keen to do, um, we published a report called Pressure in the Pipeline in 2019, which looked at how you can increase uh, low carbon gas into the grid and talked about a low carbon obligation, which the government then adopted uh, as policy. Uh, but that that is particularly looking at the role of hydrogen as well as uh, biogas in the grid and how you increase that. Please do look at that. Minister, perhaps you could speak to the questions around retrofitting existing stock uh, and connection to the gas grid. Yeah, uh, James, thank you for the question. You're absolutely right. I sort of touched upon it and maybe I was just too quick in my earlier remarks, but um, the Green Homes Grant is exactly uh, doing that. And I'd like to see the £2 billion uh, out of the door by March of next year. So there's a, you know, massive effort taking place in Bayes at the moment to get that done. Uh, it's uh, learnt all the lessons of the, the, the sort of previous attempt that um, some of you on this call will remember the you know, brilliant Greg Barker attempted uh, uh, to do something uh, uh, similar. Um, we've learned those lessons from uh, that. I think this is going to work uh, certainly a lot better and um, will deliver uh, that retrofitting uh, uh, to existing housing stock, but also to public buildings. When the Chancellor announced this, uh, there's a billion pounds for public buildings as well. Um, just on the point around the grid, you know, I want to see at least you know twenty percent of the grid sort of be moved towards hydrogen. Because back to Ben Houch's point, you know, the moment the industry begin to see that the government one has a strategy is delivering on it and that st strategy is stable then they'll make the investment i have no doubt about it so when they see uh, what quasi quartang is doing with uh, the north sea oil and gas transition deal because a lot of the assets in uh, that industry lend themselves to carbon capture uh, 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 eastern storage um that when they see us deliver our energy white paper and our ambitions around uh, both offshore and nuclear, they will very quickly work out the direction of travel, both on blue hydrogen, which we're very serious about, and green hydrogen. We think we have an opportunity in, in both. Um, uh, and I think um, the, I guess the, the one um, message I'd like to leave everyone with is that when you see the, the, the strategy, you will realize how much effort and work has gone into it and how sort of deliberate this government is being in terms of unlocking that investment. Um, I think it was um, you know, Rachel who reminded us about the uh, infrastructure around this. You know, we're looking to deliver something like 640 billion pounds of infrastructure in this parliament, right? Both social and um, uh, uh, physical uh, infrastructure. Um, th the reason we've set up uh, project speed which is chaired by the chancellors to sort of try and cut through any um impediments to make that investment happen um uh, but to do that you need a very clear strategy you know government doesn't need to pick winners but what government needs to do is to give the broad outlines of you know here is the direction uh, on the strategy here are the the areas where we think um uh, the energy is going to come from whether it be hydrogen or nuclear or renewables, right? Then let let businesses make those decisions. And and as we've seen with with offshore wind, you know, to great success. I think I go back and say we've got to learn from it. I.e., can we make sure that our R and D spend? And I think it was um, uh, the professor who who, who who talked about linking the sort of the innovation element to this. If we're looking to lift R and D spend from just shy of eleven billion a year at the moment to 22 billion a year 
by 2024, 25. That's not a long time away from now. Uh, but I think once you start sort of joining all those dots, and it's not just in base, you've got to join up with other departments. So the Department of Transport has got to be there. All the other departments, I would say. Uh, and the great thing about the legislation, now it's the law of the land, that 2050 is when we get to net zero. The whole machinery of government uh, has cranked up to deliver this. So I'm, I'm confident. I guess the one thing I can't do today, which is you know, on the sort of beginning of October, is actually share with you the strategy. But when you see it, I think you'll appreciate how much effort has gone into it. And I think it'll give the confidence of where we're heading uh, with this, uh, including a very ambitious hydrogen strategy. Great, thank you. I've got a few more questions here on, uh, and I'm keen to get people in. So I'm, I'm going to focus a bit more on transport here. So um, Pat Logard has asked, should green hydrogen use in transport be a priority for government? Uh, and Michael Williams has asked, how can we faster decarbonize aviation? Should we be flying less? Rachel. Sure, thank you. Um, so, I mean, the piece around um, green hydrogen in particular being a priority through to transport, I think, I mean, last week is, is a good example, isn't it, of significant moves in a direction that I suspect will keep on going. Personally, I think where we're headed in the, certainly the medium to long run is bound to be a mix of um, sort of the, the existing electricity provision that is already sort of sort of ramping up and has been coming through from various different um, sources as we've been hearing through this conversation but added to by the hydrogen piece and I think in terms of the specifics of the different modes different solutions will suit different modes of transport so it's absolutely the case with the pure I guess that the current electric vehicle provision that in particular the heavier vehicles um, it is in, incredibly difficult to find at the moment the, the perfect solution, if you like, in order to get the sufficient range and, and, and power and so on through. So um, I think definitely there is massive scope in the hydrogen space and specifically the green hydrogen space around that, in particular, as I say, towards the, the heavier modes, but perhaps in time, some of the lighter ones as well. The piece around um, aviation, well, COVID's interesting, isn't it, in terms of what that's what that's showing us there. So I think we are going to see a real shift in terms of travel patterns more generally and in a more strategic sense as a UK we have an opportunity here to revisit the way in which we want people to move around in terms of longer distance trips as well as the shorter distance trips in order to hook people in better to the more sustainable ways of moving around that do not involve them a jumping in a car or b necessarily assuming that the only way to get to somewhere is on a, is on a plane. But we'll see how that unfolds. Laura, can we get people flying less after COVID? I think some people will fly a bit less anyway. But um, but I agree with Rachel. I think that there will be different um, there will be different solutions for for different lengths of of travel. Um, I mean, I hope for those people who work in these sectors that um, you know we see a bounce back. But we must start to understand that innovation is absolutely crucial to decarbonize some of these, what I would call the heavy lifting that is still out there. Um, and it's certainly not impossible, but I, I also wanted to reiterate what Rachel was saying, is when, you know, not, not saying this government, but governments on the whole love silver bullets. And actually what we're going to have is a patchwork of solutions for different modes of whether they be transport, heating, etc. We'll have a mixed heat economy. And to be frank, in many ways, this is, again, enabling consumers to make choices. Um, can I just refer back to the last question? And that was around the housing standards. Um, I would say that actually having hydrogen ready boilers is a totally and utterly no regrets uh, mandate because then you're keeping all your options open. Uh, they are a hundred pounds more than a current boiler, but if they were actually procured in, at scale, they would come down dramatic, I mean, dramatically. And the other thing about home standards is when we're building new homes, actually we should be incentivizing, we should be mandating that the construction sector turn everyone's home into a little power station. They all should have, or the housing estate itself should have energy capacity, whether that be in storage terms, whether that be in EV charging, whether that be in PV. If you do it right at the inception, it is absolutely of marginal cost and absolutely ensures that we end up with a more resilient energy system than if we only rely, and we will have to rely, 
on what I call the big ticket stuff. Michael, I mean, just on hydrogen, you know, the government's very keen on it, um, but it's been talked as a kind of mass energy source for several decades. Is it being overhyped? Um, you're right. It's been around for decades and it's gone through waves. Um, what seems to me different is that there's far more direct industrial enthusiasm in hydrogen than there used to be. It used to be previously an academic fad. Um, now it feels much, I mean, we see, I think it's Mercedes-Benz have basically committed to hydrogen trucks as, as a core part of, of future trucks business. So things are really happening for multiple reasons, but partly the technological breakthroughs that there have been. Um, I just wanted to, to, to stress on that, that, well, earlier question on the, the future home standard of 2025. Yeah, it seems to me it's absolutely feasible. Uh, the key point is I'm, I'm slightly reminded in the 1990s when I tried to get a condensing boiler and the engineer said, ooh, don't know about those, you know, they're really unreliable, uh, don't really have the engineers who could do that. You know, we've got a few years to train up and to make it plain that, People need to get those skills so by 2025 we can have those properly installed in the new homes as, as per the commitment. Um, and I think a lot of that also can go in, into the Green Homes Grant. Uh, a couple of other quick things uh, on, on the way. Um, the nuclear question. To me, the question these days is... Michael, sorry, I'm just conscious of time. So I'm just going to... Uh, I'm just going to take just one final uh, round of questions, which is very quick, because then I want speakers to sum up. Uh, and it's basically um, a question from Melissa Pierce, who talks about we'll need to manage infrastructure as a connected system of systems across sectors. How can we get this joined up approach? Uh, and then secondly, from Charles Malassard, who asks, with COP26, uh, government has an opportunity to sell our planning and engineering sector as a key driver in net zero delivery to the world. Is this part of the plan? I've put these two together because I'm just interested. Obviously, this is very cross-sector, the whole net zero um, approach. So for all speakers, how can we get that joined up approach, whether it's in government, whether it's in local government, whether it's in the private sector? What sort of policies, mechanisms, processes need to be put in place so you've got different sectors working together to achieve this huge challenge of net zero. Um, so if you could keep your answer short, that would be great. <laughs> Big question, but if you could, that would be brilliant. Rachel. Thank you. Sure. Big question, tiny answer. Right. So the piece around um, connected system of systems, absolutely could not agree more. I think in the infrastructure space, the only way to understand where the joins and where the overlaps lie is to think about outcomes. If everybody concentrates on what they're actually trying to achieve, then we can think much more clearly about where the different sectors need to play into that. Without that, we're basically sort of sitting here with different government departments doing different things, and the chances of it all lining up are, are far, far reduced. So I think I think there's an enormous opportunity there in that net zero space. COP26 selling our skills to the world, absolutely. You know, we need to start now. We've got a year. Let's get cracking. <laughs> Great. Laura? Yes, and I would say, again, this connectivity. I mean, in many ways, the energy sector has been very insular for many, many years. I mean, it's now having to accommodate transport, consumer behaviour, all sorts of variables. And personally, I think that we do need some form of coordinating authority that actually pulls together all these different industries and ensures that what Rachel talks about is ensures the connectivity but also ensures that we don't create misalignments that fall between the gaps because actually the value in the future in this decarbonized uh, dividend is going to be the value will sit between the gaps not actually within the sectors and if we can get that right and really look at the knitting together we're going to get some real prizes out of this not least innovative companies making the value out of those uh, particular opportunities. Michael? Um, I agree. I, mean, I think we have a real asset with the Climate Change Act and its processes that provide the framework that enables you to look at some of those connections. COP26, um, the government and cabinet office are trying to turn that into a set of international conversations about how we transform sectors and link across them. And I think that is also an opportunity. Thank you. Very concise. Very good. And 
Oh, well, I don't have any answers to this at all. The two, the two points that I would make that I think if you want industry to work together, cross-sector or even internally within sectors, and if you look at private investors wanting to put their money where their mouth is and take the plunge, the two things are convenience and cost. Um, and if you can keep those at the front of your mind about how you make it convenient and how you reduce cost, you can often overcomplicate it by trying to manage the market. Whereas actually, if you focus on answering those two questions, then the market will manage itself. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Minister, final words. Thank you. Right. Well, look, the game changer is the legislation. So the law of the land is net zero by 2050. Um, if you go to the investment markets today and uh, offer them a hydrocarbon project, you'll very likely not um, be very disappointed. You won't succeed. Or the, the, the cost of money will be exorbitant. Whereas if you go with a green project, uh, you probably you know, have a, a sort of uh, just a, a gushing pipe of, of, of uh, investment coming towards you at very low cost, which is what's making the big difference. I think back to the professor's point about why industry is beginning to focus on this is because the cost of money has come down tremendously because you know the investment community can see the direction of travel. Um, what can we do? I think you start with a strategy. So the, the energy white paper is your starting point, and you will see within that, by the way, the, the, the whole question of connected systems and what that looks like. Uh, the other part of that is, uh, I remind my officials every day, is we can't hug the world. You have to give people reason to believe. And the way they do now with offshore wind, that's when you begin to build on it and be even more ambitious. And we need to do the same in all the other sort of portfolio of energy uh, production. But then you've got to also just face the fact that you've got to work, one, across government. So Department of Transport, incredibly important, MHCLG, incredibly important. But to pull that together is number 10 and the Prime Minister's absolute commitment to this, which is a big, big win, I think, across the board uh, for anyone who's passionate about uh, net zero. Because from day one, when he stood at the steps of number 10, he, he talked about the, the, the clean growth that he wants to, to deliver. So if you look at Jet Zero and what we're doing on the Jet Zero Council, I don't think you need to fly less. You need to make sure that you invest in innovation, whether it's some of the challenges that are coming through on hydrogen flight or electric flight or the Airbuses of this world uh, who are also coming forward with big ideas because they, they also can see the direction of travel. A lot to do, but I think, um, I guess the message is prioritize. So don't try and hug the world. Give people reason to believe because once you deliver stuff on the ground, not just talk about it on, you know, very clever uh, platforms, uh, uh, then they will begin to, to trust you and believe you. And just remember, you're also competing with the rest of the world because every, all the developed economies are trying to do the same thing. And I think these, those are, for me, the three mantras when I go in the office every morning that I live by. Good stuff. Thank you, Nadim. Uh, and thank you to WSP in particular for partnering with us on the event. Thank you to everybody who is watching. Just to say that um, Bright Blue is hosting 15 fringe events at this conference and our next one is in half an hour on child poverty. Uh, so please uh, do stick around for that if you're interested. Uh, and if you're interested in becoming a member of Bright Blue, then the caption um, helpfully has it there, go to that website. Uh, and if we could have a final round of applause virtually uh, for um, the speakers, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. Very grateful.